Thank you. All right. I'm not holding my Okay. So put the focus where it really needs to be. Um, but my name is Peter Verheyen. I am a bookbinder and conservator based in Syracuse, New York. And one of my interests in this field is making parchment from fish skin. Um, this is something I learned about as part of my big Ernst Collin translation project, going through the literature. There were articles that kept popping up, then also in some of my German trade manuals and journals, and didn't really get a lot of information. Did find one article saying how incredibly strong fish skin could be, um, but really nothing that would help me make it reached out to some other people and was given a few suggestions, one of which was unscented dish detergent, works great. And um, cold water, never warm, never tepid, never hot, cold. And in the interim, I found a lot of um, tutorials. There's on YouTube for tanning, on Instagram, there's an Amber Sandy who happens to be in in the Toronto area and who is an indigenous educator and science advocate. And she's been doing an awful lot with fish skin, AMB Sandy on Instagram. And it's really worth taking a look at. She's got some really clear instructions for her tanning processes, which are a little bit different from what I'm gonna demonstrate. Um, ditto some of the things on other things on YouTube. Basically, what I'm going to be demonstrating is making parchment from fish skin. So think Western European traditional parchment. Um, the skin is untanned and gets rinsed in dish detergent, cold dish detergent. And this is something I do sometimes at least several days, sometimes a week depends on when I can get to it. I always keep it in the fridge because you don't want things to spoil. Um, I did store it once in the back of my fridge where it froze solid. That definitely did not hurt it. And if you need to buy time, freeze your skin. Um, so try, you know, doing that. And then what you need to do is you need to scrape the fleshy stuff off and then rinse it again, and then you stretch it out. And so one of the first questions I've gotten is, where do you get your fish and what size and what species? So far, I've only had one fail with a fish. That was some sardine, fresh sardine, and that skin was just too thin to get off. I suppose I could have wasted the meat on the fish, but I didn't really want to do that because it's a good meal. Um, Salmon, I think, is the best fish to start out with. It's a great starter fish. It tastes great. Um, you can get fillets with the skin on in a variety of sizes here in central New York and pretty much up and down the East Coast now in the Northeast. Um, Wegmans has a great seafood counter, and you can get fish that are, you know, kind of the size of this. So... This is almost, almost 18 inches or so. And you can cut it. You can slice the, um, you know, you can put it into different sizes, whatever works for you. And it's really hard to pick the wrong species. What's important is that you, again, keep it cold. And then also when you're scraping it off on the back, fish strings, yeah, fish skin is incredibly strong. It's almost hard to damage, but you also on the, when you're scraping off, if you have it with scales, you wanna be gentle on that side because that's where a lot of the really interesting textures are. Um, a lot of the color of a fish will be in the scales, some in the meat, in the skin, I mean. And so, you know, you wanna be a little bit gentler. So what we're gonna do now is these are, I'm gonna, Focus it down on what I need to now. Let's see how that looks. Good. So 
this is my all-purpose tool for, for scraping off the fish skin. Um, I used to, when I first started out, I'd really, you know, get a little obsessive about it. I'd use a scalpel, really sharp, fresh blade, and um, a spatula to scrape. In some respects, I think I was being way too precious. It certainly may help getting the skin off, but when you're doing the um, scraping off the fleshy bits, it's it's just too small, too delicate, too precious. Um, you can, if you go to you know better fish counter, ask them to take the skin off the fish. They have done that. They will look at you strangely, especially when you say you want it back. At this point, um, you know, Corona aside, I haven't really gone shopping for fish, but I have a neighbor who absolutely loves salmon and who will who takes the skin off and delivers the skin across the street to me. So that's what we're working on here today. So what I've done with the skin is, I'm gonna open it up now. Oh, come on. So this is about a third maybe a little bit less of the salmon. Um, didn't want to waste it and wanted to have a nice big piece, but wanted to show the two-step process. And you can see on here that there's still a lot of the meat. And um, when I was initially starting out, I would really, I wanted it all off in the skinning process. And Again, that's just a little bit too much. So what I've done now and the skins that I get from my neighbor, I don't really worry about it. I let it soak in cold dish detergent overnight, and then I'll make a first pass at scraping it off. And you can see how it's just coming off. around a little bit because it's a little easier for me to scrape it this way and I can get a little bit more leverage. If this fish hadn't been soaked in um, dish detergent and was still, the skin was fresh, you could probably some of these things you could feed to a pet, as was suggested in one of Amber's videos. Um, she also had a fantastic idea, which is maybe a little bit harder to do now, but go to your local sushi restaurant or seafood restaurant and ask them if they have skins. Normally, these are things that would get tossed out in the trash, and um, why waste it? Yes. I assume that the fish has been descaled as well before soaking. Yes. Um, although if you get fish and it still has the scales on it, the, just the soaking, soaking it in the cold dish detergent really does help get the scales off. This skin has been descaled. That's how it was sold. That's how a lot of them seem to be sold around here. Um, but yes. You definitely want to do that. And the scales will come off on their own running through your hand. You don't want to really work into it with a knife or a spatula or something. And just to remind everybody, I'm using the back of the knife, not the blade for this. But you can see how the skin stretches. You can see the bits of meat coming off. Yes, it's a little on the gross side, um, but 
you know, it's really no different than going to bookbinding camp and staking out an elk that you found or recently hunted and then um, alum tying it in the dirt. There are people who actually pay to do that. When I was younger, I think I would have loved to do it at least once, but fish is different and fish works well and you can do it on your kitchen table. You can do it on your workbench. You can do it on a photo tray in a photo tray on your desk. And now, right now I'm at, this is the tail where it was cut off. And what you'll find very often, especially along the belly and along the, um, the spine of the skin is that there's some really, really hard, almost tendon like stuff. And that just requires a little bit more effort but you can get most of that off. And then um, when it's dry, we'll do a little bit more with a sharp scalpel and just kind of chip away at it. And this is really the, this is about as messy as it gets. It's really not that horrible. Um, I'm gonna try to show you, hope the light cooperates. Okay, here, you can see on the skin, you can see these like thread-like fibers. And this is what the, um, the flesh side of the fish will look like. When you, when you make parchment, and in some tanning processes, I, I did tan once and I was using an egg solution for that. And it was pretty smooth when I peeled it off, but the fibers do come back. You can scrape those off. You can um, sand them off when it's dry. If you buy tanned fish leather, sometimes it'll be really... Um, hairy, for lack of a better word. You'll have all these little fibers all over the place. You can actually just pull them out with your fingers. Um, but what I generally do is just give it a, um, an adhesive wash, like a paste or a PVA mixture, let it dry on something, and then just sand it. The texture of the fish skin, which is um, fairly pronounced, especially on something like a salmon, at the end of the day, if you use it on a binding or something, if you did a reasonable job on it, you'll never know that it's there. So I'm just gonna look and take a see what's here. There's a few more bits and I may just go to the knife and just kind of scrape a little. Okay. And now I'm just going to put that in here. This is just the soapy water it was in. And rinse it some. And then so you can see that the skin is now pretty clean. I've gotten all the bigger, more obvious pieces of meat off. I'll look at it in different light and see if there's anything else that's still clearly stuck to the skin. Um, most of it just is our little loose pieces. This is the grain side, the, the scale side. And if you look at this carefully, you can see like in, in the black areas up closest to you that there's some patches where it looks like the skin is damaged. And that is the case. And that's something where whoever was scaling it was maybe a little too aggressive. Um, the color that's in here, this is Atlantic salmon. They tend to be blackish and then going to a silvery whitish. A lot of that darker part will, I don't want to say fade out, but it gets lighter when it's dry. The skin can be very translucent. Um, use that to your advantage. You can um, line it with things. 
on um i did post a video i think it's here on youtube certainly it's on my blog and i used easter egg dyes it's what we had in the house it had a fish skin i have no idea how color fast the that is but um i tried it and i'll show you the results does it smell um at this stage let me check it's been rinsing for about four days i don't really take there, there's a fish smell a little bit but but it's it's not really that pronounced you definitely do not want to skimp on the pr rinsing process the washing and detergent and and that's something where i've changed it probably on average twice a day and that helps get rid of a lot of the oils um this part here still had some meat on it so i think you're probably smelling some of that as well if i'm going to put this back in the soapy water and let it rinse and um and then we'll see the worst for lack of a better word skin that i ever had was a mackerel and that mackerel is an incredibly oily fish and so the cleaning process and turning it into the parchment really reduced that a, a lot but there was still enough of it there and it felt a little on the fleshy side a little um, oily so what i did was just wash that in acetone and just brush that in and that took it out right there um, if you let your skins dry in the sun the uv will help a lot as well but the smell really does go away i have two books two bindings i'm going to show you that i made one with salmon the other with the mackerel and you can't smell it anymore i mean it's just like any other parchment and let's be honest those of us who work with leather and um parchment you know if we paste it out you can still smell some of the animal like properties in it but no it's not fishy um it's not going to attract all the neighborhood cats or anything like that. But it's just, it's a really nifty material and you can do any number of things with it. Use it as it is. Um, take advantage of the variations and the gradations. You can dye it. You can back it with Japanese paper, different colors. You can paint it. Um, but I'm just going to put this back in here. What's the concentration of detergent? Um, concentration of detergent. I take a really good squeeze, especially at the beginning, and really stir it up with the skin, shake it, get it in there. Um, I'll massage it into the skin a little bit and keep changing it. There, are, I, I really don't have any exact proportions. And one of the things with the fish skin is I didn't really find any instructions that said, this is what you need to do. These are the proportions for it. So making it up as I go, and it's worked out pretty well. The best instructions I found were in an article in a German um, apprentice bookbinding journal. And that was the story of Phipps and his eels. And basically said he went to the fishmonger next door and said he wanted an eel. No just the skin, no meat, um, and had some perplexed, perplexed looks, got what he needed, and scraped it, and hung it out to dry in the shop yard. Okay, put that back. So this is a skin that I've been rinsing. This is the other part of the fish, and this has just been sitting in cold water now, and so the next step we're going to do is we're going to tie it, stake it out with... Um, push pins on foam core. What also works really, really well for doing this kind of work are coroplast. You can get lots of free coroplast in the form of yard signs, especially during election season. And um, the coroplast is nice, it's strong, and you can really put the pins through it. I usually, and I'm gonna do it, um, take the skin and put it um, scale side down, but just want to show you like right here, you can see some patches where this um, skin 
where the scales were was damaged. Some of it you can smooth out, but it, it really varies. So I'm going to flip this over and then get my push pins. These are just your regular garden variety push pins, nothing special. Um, that's really the nice thing about doing this with fish is that you, you don't need anything special. You have just about everything you need at home. And, um, you know, the only real waste product here is the meat, which is delicious. So I heartily recommend eating fish. Um, one thing I've noticed is that wild caught salmon skin seems to be a little bit thicker than the farm raised, perfectly logical. And okay. I like to space my pins fairly tightly. And I'll just go down one side. Just, you know, stretch it a little bit, push in the pin, move down a little bit further. Here's a piece of stuff that I will tear off. Don't seem to have lost anybody. We're up to 100 viewers. It's kind of cool. There's a conservator asking a question. Yes, it is. Holitex, not Rime, Holitex. Um, still have some around, lots of it actually. It's a wonderful material for doing this on because you never know if the skin is going to stick or not. And it's just a nice barrier that you can work on rather than working on a piece of paper that's going to get all wet and gross and Yes. And, you know, I've used this piece of foam core many, many times. And so it's got lots and lots of holes in it, but you can always find new holes, new places to make holes. The yes. The skin still seemed frothy. Do you not fully rinse out the detergent before it's stretch dry? Um, yeah, there's a little bit in the water. I did rinse this quite thoroughly. Um, for the purposes of this, um, it's maybe got a little bit more soapiness in there, but it's not, it's, this is just unscented and I don't think it's going to cause any problems. The one thing I was worried about when I was dying and I used the Easter egg dyes, and it's also something I was, I noticed in, um, with fabric dyes is they require the addition of vinegar. Um, so I have a skin that I'll show you from a very rare uh, tiger salmon. It's a purple fish, but where the skin, you know, where it was dyed with the vinegar, it doesn't seem to have caused any issues so far, but I'm just watching it. Um, if we only have Rime, is there anything negative about using it? Absolutely not. If you only have Rime, use it. If you, you know, whatever works. You know, like Phipps with his eels, you make it up as you go. Um, there's wonderful sharing of things related to fish leather, fish parchment. Somehow, for whatever reason, maybe I'm looking more, but I seem to be seeing more and more of it. Um, who is it? It's in um, 
The University of the Arts in London in their fashion program is doing a lot with fish for, you know, for fashion, but also a lot of workshops. I posted something this morning about an online workshop. So there seem to be more and more opportunities. One of the things I like about fish, and it's kind of relates to what I was saying about bookbinders and conservators loving experiences where they can, you know, tan a hide out in the wilds or something. This is fairly small and it's fairly easy and it's really not as messy or gross as it looks, but this would be a perfect thing to do with, let's say, a workshop in a history of the book class. And when all this is behind us and before the next plague hits, combine it with a good meal. And so you all skin your fishes, no cheating and buying skin fish. And then you go out and cook it. And everybody gets something back. And this is, you know, fish has been used on books for clothing for lots and lots of things. So it's not like this is a totally new novel material. I think we're just rediscovering it. In other places, are looking at us and saying, really? Okay. Some of the pins are popping up a little bit. Okay. Angle these so that they go. Do you ever get tear out or large holes from the push pins? Have you ever tried using something like binder clips? Um, good question. Yes, I actually. Um, this is about push pins versus binder clips and things. The first time I ever did it, I did use binders clips. And what I did was use a staple gun to staple the binders, one part of the binders clip into the wood. I find that it's just, for me, it was just too fiddly, too physical to really get the push pin, the binder clips, get it positioned, position the staple gun, pull it. Um, you can, you're certainly welcome to use binder clips. There's nothing wrong with them, but I just found that push pins were a lot easier, especially when you stick the push pins into something, you know, like, um, foam core. So here's the skin. And so this is going to take a while to dry and, um, it's a nice day. I may actually, when we stop here, put it outside in the sun to dry and then I'll share pictures of it um, when it's done. But you know, this is really all that's involved. And I'll show you some other skins and some books now. Okay, one question. Yes. How much are you pulling or how tightly are you stretching the skin? I'm pu pulling and stretching the skin as tightly as I can. Um, to get back to the previous question, yes, I've had things tear out. Often that's... Um, if I was too close to the edge or I overworked it or the skin was a little on the thinner side there, there's factors, but it's really, really hard to tear out. Um, the one thing that I will emphasize again and again, and I did at the beginning is you really have to use cold water for the entirety of this process. And if you use warm water, and by warm water, I mean even something that is, you know, in today's world, we might consider still a little too cold to properly wash our hands, um, that can cause the skin to break down almost instantly. And I had, and I'll show you, some beautiful Arctic char. And I was getting ready to do the final rinse before staking it out. And got somewhere in there, got a little bit of tepid water on there, and the skin started to stretch strangely. I did get tear outs. Um, it basically felt very gelatinous. And, you know, if you get 
in warm water, the skin will start to break down and almost dissolve. Oh, I'm getting question. Yes. When binding with fish parchment, is it closer to binding with other parchments in the sense that minimal water slash liquid should be used? Um, I I don't know about minimal in terms of binding. I work. You can work it just like regular parchment. Um, in terms of too much water, too little, it really depends on what you're doing. When I first learned to bind with parchment, you know, we would paste out the skins and work it. And a lot of the um, literature has referred to it that way. Um, what I've gotten to do more of is use a mixture of PVA with paste for the turn-ins mixed in with a little bit of PVA and certainly for the head caps if I'm forming them. But you can do it with PVA uh, or a mixture. I really do recommend a mixture because it just gives you more time. And you may need to dampen the skin. You're not going to damage it. Um, there was in the um, about 100 years ago when this was a top this topic was first published about in a modern sense it was described they worked it over raised cords and in german book binding at the time including leather leather was often paired sopping wet um, with working this over the cords if you have a completely wet skin you can beautifully mold it over any cords and it'll stay there until it pops off as vellum is wont to do over raised cords. But no, you can work it pretty much just like any other material. Can you just hand me one of the um, things I can wipe my fingers on? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know. All right, so I'm going to angle this up a little bit. So I brought my menagerie here. So this is, you know, to get back to the the water issue. This was one of the char, and the skin is much much thinner. And if you watch here, it you know it tears like nothing. And if you take a regular healthy char, you can't, it doesn't tear at all. And um, it's just like salmon. It has, fish skin has an incredible tear and fold strength. Um, Tim Barrett tested some of the skins. I gave him a salmon he comp and a piece of goat vellum of the same thickness and had him compare it with this PC4. And the fold strength of the salmon was off the chart and almost exceeded the, um, the counter on the fold device. And it failed the tear test because it couldn't be torn completely through. But these are, this is, you can see it here. You can see the spotting. This is Arctic char. When it came off the fish, it was very, um, it was kind of pinkish at the top, more whitish here. You can see that the color really went away, but you can also still see those spots that were there. And this is something that you can really use to advantage. You know, if you back it, if you color it, it'll, you know, have different things. Um, you know, this is the back side of it. You can see the lateral line and, you know, it's not straight. You know, if I was really worried, I might try to straighten it out. But, you know, again, it's something that can be worked into the design. Yes. What happens if these get wet after binding, for example, in a disaster situation? How would you recover fish skin binding through the flood? Um, pretty much the same way you would deal with a leather binding, whether it's, you know, modern leather or 19th, early 20th century leather that has red rot that turns into a black sludge. This won't turn into a black sludge or anything like that. But it is, it, you know, if you have a disaster, pretty much any of our materials are going to be a problem. 
Um, you know, modern leather binding, if it gets wet, you'll have water stains. You'll have things where the adhesives may soften, come off. We, you know, it's, it's nice to keep in mind. And I think it's something you definitely want to think about, especially right now during preservation week. But when we use some of these materials, you know, as binders, as conservators, we're kind of hoping that they're going to be in the best possible environment. Yes, disasters can happen. Florence happens. Katrina happens. Um, but, you know, as, as artists or something like that, you also can't really let that hold you back. Um, I don't know if that answers the question in any useful way. This is the other half of the mackerel. And you can see on here, you can see the, um, let me see if I can get a good light. You can see the fibers from the skin. You can see the, um, you know, this fish had a lot of scars on it. Mackerel doesn't have scales, but, you know, the, some of the pigmentation wore off. This right here was where there was actually a cut in the skin before I got to it. Um, and you can see the spots in it. I mean, it's a really beautiful kind of metallic skin. If you feel it in your hands, it's almost like Tyvek and, um, doesn't smell. Yeah. The flash side looks very smooth. Do you sand it lightly prior to applying adhesive to open up porosity? Um, the flesh side isn't really as smooth as it looks, but yes, you can lightly sand it to get better adhesion. Um, the other thing that I'll do, and it, the seg that's a good question, is you know even though I've rinsed and rinsed the salmon and or any of these fish, there are still some oils in the skin. And so one of the things you'll notice as it's drying, especially if it's a little bit warmer, is you'll see little, and you'll see it more on the flesh side than the scale side, you'll see little droplets on them. And those are some of the oils. So what I'll definitely do before, you know, applying adhesive is I'll give it a wipe down with some acetone or some ethanol just to kind of get that, those oils off. I've had to do similar with um, modern goat parchment as well, but no, it, it absolutely does not hurt the skin and it's not inadvisable to um, sand it lightly. This is a piece of haddock, which is, you know, again, you can see how incredibly translucent it is. Those white patches that you see are actually little bits of fleshy stuff that are still attached to it. Um, so this is, and the haddock, I treated two different ways. This is the, um, this is the one that I did just as parchment. And then this is the one that I egg tanned and which is nominally more flexible, feels a little bit more like leather. It's still very shiny. Um, you know, I did not work this to the extent that you would work a, a, a skin that you've tanned that you want to have more leather-like properties, you know, soft, supple. Um, it's much more like parchment, but I thought it was interesting to just do, you know, half the fish one way, the other half the other to have a comparison point. Um, this is really interesting. Let me see if I can get it to focus. But this is where, this is up near the head, but the black coloration is very strong but it almost looks like graphite or um, carbon fiber. You know, you could do something wicked with that. Um, this is snapper or um, sea bass. I don't really remember which. And you can see that where this, you know, this fish had larger scales. The scales on the char are very small. So it looks, you know, like netting. Um, I call this my seahorse because it really does look like a seahorse. And... Is the translucency from the species type thinness or something else? Um, the tr question about the translucency, it really, it thinness definitely plays a role, but as you'll see with another salmon skin, I mean, parchment is even if you were to get it from a goat or a calf, depending on how thin the skin is, what area 
and how it was stretched and prepared, you can get areas of translucency. And that's actually one of the things that I really like the most about it is that translucency and taking advantage of it. Um, but you know this this here just to you know talk about the coloration was much more orangey with the black and yellowish down here and it's pretty much the colors don't really stay to the degree that you would think that they do and then this is another um, Wegman's um, salmon this is coho but I egg tanned it and it's still a little like parchment. And you can see here where I was trying to work it to get it smoother. Um, I may go back to this or I may not, but it, it's an interesting experiment and it's something I definitely want to try again someday. There's some really interesting methods of tanning with tea. Um, two more and then we'll look at the book. And then... Can you do it? Let me just pick up the paper that's on the, on the light. So this was a big salmon that I did a while ago. And, you know, you can see how translucent it is. And this is a photograph that's behind it. But when you're looking at it, you can also still see the texture of the skin. And so it's interesting. Question. Somebody said, and then somebody said, in the Midwest, we have a lot of catfish. Have you ever used that? I know they don't have scales, but they are at time, times very large. Catfish, be still my heart. Um, growing up in Maryland, used to go bullhead and catfish fishing. Need to find some here. If you can get a good, if you can catch a good channel cat and you need to skin catfish anyway to eat it. Um, yes, definitely. Those skins are going to be super strong and have really neat properties. When you egg tan a fish skin, is there a particular type of egg that you use? Uh, mm, I use, because that's what we have in the house, organic free range chicken eggs. Um, I mixed it up with a um, dish detergent as well to get it in there and worked it. And it's, again, it's something I've only done once. Most of everything that I do is related to parchment, which is kind of my favorite material. But I would say experiment. There's a lot of different recipes out there. This is the Easter egg fish. And when I put it out to dry, I, I used organic happy chicken Easter egg dye. Um, the dye is based on beet, and I have no idea how light fast this is going to be. I have no idea what effect the vinegar might have had. Um, I did rinse the skin after the dye, but probably not enough to really get it out. But anyways, when I staked it out, I had a piece of paper behind it to help absorb some of the moisture. And I was noticing as it was drying these, you know, almost like tiger stripes and was wondering where they came from. And then when I took it off, this is where it stuck to this paper and it came off with the exception of one spot very easily with leaving behind this minimal residue. But again, you know, it's not going to, this is good paper, doesn't really matter, can lightly sand it off, but it really left some interesting color. And if we, if I hold it up this way, you can see the light shining through. So, you know, again, this was a totally random effect. I really like it. I have no idea what I'm going to do with this skin, but it would be fun to use on a book. And then finally, show you two bindings, two different fish. The first one is, this is my little print-on-demand version of my bone folder translation. Um, the book is eight and a half by 11 folded in half with minimal trim. Um, the binding structure is a Danish millimeter, so the book is back 90-ish degrees. It has its shoulder. The boards are set back a little bit. 
And then the material goes, spine covering goes across and is really only visible that minimal millimeter um, on the cover. But you can see how the texture of the fish skin is pronounced, how it's visible. And the sides of the book are paste paper. Nice veininess. And then this is Old Man in the Sea covered with the other half of that mackerel. And what I did was on the inside, I just left the edge of the fish as it was. And so this is kind of, it's, it's helping tell the story. So Santiago goes out in his boat hasn't caught anything in a long time, catches a swordfish. Mackerel had to stand in for swordfish. A little hard to get, a little thick. And the fish was eaten by sharks as he was trying to get it back. And the book was sewn on shark leather. It com was commercially available. Thongs as a sewing support. It's an open joint, so you can see through. End papers are cave paper the indigo night but you know this the mackerel worked really well as a metaphor but also you know the scars of it so you can see here that was a scratch that was in the skin you know this fish you know ditto in some of these places this fish fought for its life and then you know it was chewed up as it was tied to the boat so you know, it really ties it together nicely. And the boards are covered in, this is a pergamina goat parchment. So. I really like the skin on the inside. Yeah, and it's, you know, for some people, it takes getting used to seeing. Um, but I've sent another copy of my bone folder, the Boss Dog Press Edition, which is more like, 10 by 12 inches, quarter parchment spine. I sent it in for the Society of Bookbinders competition. Didn't get any comments about fishy smell, was honest about what it was covered in. And I really encourage people to experiment with it. Um, you know, the other, just to be self-serving, I haven't done it in a number of years, but based on the interest in the fish that I've, you know, based on comments I've had, started a binderama. Books will be due, I think, the end of June or boxes or something like that. But I really want to encourage people, especially those who have been asking, well, how do you do this? How do you do this? To just try it. It's, it's really, it's fun. It's simple. You get a good meal out of it. Um, you know, the suggestion from Amber Sandy in one of her videos was also just go to your local sushi restaurants or fish counters, ask them for the skins. Um, that really, that saves a lot of people that work, which is really the fussiest and to some the grossest parts. Um, make sure that like Julia Child, you are alone in the kitchen, but sometimes that can't be avoided. And, but mostly just try it out. I mean, it's an incredibly strong material it's a beautiful material, and I thank you for your interest. Any other last questions? From anyone? No? Well, thank you very much, and I will make sure that this gets um, It'll be posted, and if people have questions, you know, post them in the chat. And um, no, Beth, you cannot make parchment out of already cooked fish because that is pretty much the same thing as putting it in boiling or hot water. And it really it breaks down the skin if you've ever had the fish, and um, you know it's been cooked, especially depending on how you do it. It's not really advisable, never mind you're adding olive oil or butter or something like that. Um, I do, do know, and I think it was Monica Longway in Sweden who said something, this was several years ago, 
about having pulled the skin off a smoked fish. I have I tried that when we had a smoked salmon in the house, and it didn't really come off as cleanly as I thought it should. And I didn't want to waste any of the meat because it was really delicious. Um, but you know, you can try it if you want. Again, it's a very easy, fun way to just experiment. Um, drying conditions. Right now, and with the skins I made over the winter, I just let the, them dry at room temperature in my basement down here. It does get fairly chilly. So I put it a little bit closer to a um, kind of a radiator style space heater that I have. And, um, you know, just let it dry. Again, you're not rushing it. Um, to the question of um, Easter egg dyes and leather dyes and no-go, I have not yet tried leather dyes. I've heard fabric dyes recommended. I've seen tea and other more, you know, barks and things like that mentioned as also coloring agents. There's no reason you couldn't use leather dye. The thing that I've noticed with the fabric dyes is A, the addition of vinegar, and B, mixing it up in hot water. And you can't put the fish skin in the hot water. So I basically need to try, you know, mix up some dye, let it get cold, and then put it in. It might not, I mean, the, the worst that might happen is that the skin, the color is just a little bit more faded out, not quite as stark. Um, information on the Binderama, it was posted to the Book Arts Listserv um, and social media. I will send out a reminder with and embed this video in there. And I really, you know, encourage you to try it out. The only condi real condition on the Binderama is you have to process your own fish skin. I don't want to see anybody going out and buying fish skin from someone else, no matter how beautiful it is. Um, I really want the idea is that you experience the whole process because it really is something that you can do. Um, it doesn't have to be a book. So if you're a paper and origami artist, fish skin, you can probably make something beautiful origami like out of. You can use it to fold boxes. You can do any number of things. It's a lot of fun and if there's any more questions, no more questions, I will say goodbye and happy fishing. Um, another question, could you soak the wet dyed skin in a cold solution? Yeah, there's no reason I um, couldn't do that. Um, calcium carbonate could work. Calcium hydroxide is a little bit more aggressive. Um, I'll see. And at this point, I'm not really worrying about it too much. But again, it's one of those things where certainly from a conservation bookbinder's perspective, not a lot has been written about it. Um, the only things I could find about fish and binding are in the German literature. There were some references in kind of the World War I, post-World War I era about, you know, we have shortages of things, they're still rationing. And this was in the English as well as the American, like the fisheries newsletters. I found references about make using fish skin for any number of things where leather might have been used. And um, so, but you know, in terms of book binding, other than what I found in the German trade journals, there hasn't really been anything. So I was really encouraged by what little tidbits I had and people who would say kind of with a sly smirk and go for it, have fun. It is fun. And I'm really, really glad I did this. I'm going to continue doing it. And I really hope that you all try it out and share your results. Um, it's been fun to see Lena in the UK sharing hers on Instagram. Um, thank you to Abigail Bainbridge for encouraging me to do this webinar approach, and I hope it was enjoyable, and thank you very, very much. Bye-bye.